Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 11, 2014, East Chester Board of Education meeting. If you would all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and with that, I'm going to actually turn over the microphone to our superintendent for the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you very much and good evening everyone. We have with us tonight a very special group from the high school, um, a group of students who went on the Eastern European trip uh, with Ms. Kane, and I'm going to have her come up to, uh, to the podium with her students. They're going to tell us all about their trip, and uh, we're delighted that you're here tonight and very excited to hear about what it was. So please come on up. What is the ripple effect? As I sat at the bottom of the base of the cliff at Mauthausen concentration camp and stared distantly at the cold, dark, still lake that was just a few feet in front of me, I learned what the ripple effect was. I picked up a small, tiny, insignificant pebble that was next to my boot and threw it up high and into the lake. When the pebble got swallowed by the water, ripples spread out from where the pebble had disappeared into and the ripples did not stop until the entire lake was covered in ripples. This tiny, insignificant pebble had taken the then precariously still, immense lake and put small ripples everywhere throughout it. Not one part of the lake went affected by that pebble. Not one molecule of water went unmoved. If an insignificant pebble the size of a penny could cause all of this change in the lake, just think of how much of a difference just one word or one action can make on the world. The ripple effect is the little things that you do every day that you think went unnoticed when in reality the whole world is changed by that one small action. During the course of this trip, we experienced seven concentration camps. The conditions in these camps were unimaginable. Overcrowded, unsanitary, all created to kill innocent people. One of the most moving camps, Auschwitz II Birkenau, held 200,000 prisoners, more than four times the amount of people it was meant to hold. The conditions were horrible. Dead bodies were piled up everywhere, human waste was all over the place, it was overrun with various sorts of vermin and rats, and the entire camp perpetually reeked the odor of dirty, dead humans. Prisoners were fed a maximum of 700 calories a day and were first to work hard labor, often resulting in death by exhaustion. And those who didn't die and were deemed unfit to work were sent to gas chambers to be killed. One of the most haunting parts of this trip was witnessing how many different tactics were created just to kill people. In one of the camps, Buchenwald, prisoners were told they were being given a checkup and were instructed to stand against a wall to be measured. Behind this wall was an SS officer ready to shoot a bullet through the back of each prisoner's head. After the prisoner was shot, the body would be taken away, the floor was wiped, and the next victim was brought in. Jews were not looked at as humans. They were viewed as no more than the vermin running through the camp, and they had to be killed. Towards the end of our trip, we visited Buchenwald concentration camp. By this point, we had learned that SS officers lived with their families at the camps, but we were surprised to hear from our tour guide that there was actually a petting zoo on the grounds. Our guide told us of an occasion where guards had to be reprimanded by their superiors for teasing a deer, tying it to the fence by its horns on the grounds that such cruel behavior was un-German-like. Meanwhile, literally feet away was the crematorium where Jews were being cremated after having suffered torture, abuse, and murder at the hands of the same guards. Such a juxtaposition completely defies logic. 
What does it tell us that humans were being treated worse than animals? Our group came away with a sense of just how incomprehensible the events of the Holocaust were. The Pennington next to the crematorium was just one of the many contrasts our group came across. The guards at these camps enjoyed swimming pools and other forms of entertainment, while people were simultaneously being murdered. Our group found it impossible to explain such callousness. However, it was through these difficulties, through these difficult discoveries, that we could truly become committed to the lessons that we had learned. Near the end of the trip, we visited the Nazi headquarters in Nuremberg, where the trials took place. Over the course of the week, what we learned about the denial or hiding that the Holocaust happened was astonishing. An exhibit that really impacted my understanding was a video that showed Nazi leaders walking into the courtroom, casually and nonchalantly shaking hands and laughing. It was as if their actions in the past eight years didn't affect them emotionally or mentally. I just couldn't comprehend how these men could live their lives like that after having killed over six million people. It was an example of humanity at its worst. It took several brutal years to murder millions of people and only a few short months to put the murders on trial. It troubles me to think that surrounding countries, including our own, didn't get involved for the several years to stop the killings. Another exhibit that had really impacted my understanding was a list of Nazi was a list of Nazi soldiers convicted and the punishment they endured. To my surprise, not all Nazis were sentenced to death and some were even ruled not guilty. A survivor who came to talk to us, Dr. Avital, said that no matter if the Nazis were killed or not, a person cannot be killed six million times, so justice will never be served. Going to Europe and experiencing the remains of the Holocaust has given me and all the other students who went a new perspective on how we treat others and what it means to bully another person. As I was walking through the concentration camps, a million questions rushed into my head. How could someone do this? How could one human treat another with such little respect and worth? How could nobody stand up to a ruthless regime? Hitler treated the Jews as vermin, and it is important for us to come back from this experience and understand that when we criticize others or exclude them, we are doing more than hurting that person. We are setting a path of hate and pain. One of the most moving experiences I had was when we went around in a circle and shared what we liked most about one another. As I looked around the room, a simple compliment had put a smile on every person in the room. Many people think that genocide is a thing of the past that could, ha that could never happen again. But the events in Germany must have started out small too. So small that no one even spoke out as it got worse and worse. Bullying functions in the same way. It's a small action that has the potential to get worse and worse. When we go through our everyday lives, we need to treat others as we would like to be treated. And remember that small acts of bullying and treating others without respect is just repeating history. It is impossible to understand why the Nazis murdered the lives of six million innocent people. It shocks me how one person has the power to deceive such a large group of people and how far hatred can go. The Holocaust began even before the crystal knocked. It began when a single man came up with the idea of hatred. This trip made me truly realize that any kind of hatred cannot be tolerated. We must appreciate each other's differences because our qualities make up who we are. We cannot judge people for their race, gender, or age. We must speak out when we see people showing hatred towards one another. I have lived in five countries previous to this and it was always hard to be the new kid. I would be bullied for my race and the kids would make faces at me. I used to feel very insecure about who I am and it has taken me so much time to feel confident about myself. This is why I feel strongly about embracing diversity. After visiting each of the camps, I felt many emotions that I couldn't identify, but I knew one of them to be anger. Anger at the Nazis for their horrendous crimes. Anger at humanity for standing by and allowing those crimes to happen. Not only the people who live nearby the concentration camps, but officials in Europe and in the United States as well knew about the Nazis' death camps, yet did nothing. Of course, I never saw the horrors of the Holocaust directly, but I saw the proof of the slaughter committed, and those are images that will haunt me forever. How could those who live near the camps and did see the Nazis' crimes firsthand go on with their lives undisturbed? Anger is not productive, though. Something which I am sure not only I, but all of us took away from the trip 
was to translate that anger into motivation to change the world we live in today, whether it be through spreading the message of what we have learned or through small acts of kindness. As Lala and Gail said, hatred begins small, and if allowed to fester, it can unleash the evil that lies in all of us. Sometimes the biggest changes require first a change that seems relatively small, a change in ourselves. True change only begins when we take responsibility and strive to set an example that others can be inspired by. It is one thing to say you're going to take action and another to take action. Human nature often leads us to fall back into complacency, but in order to move forward, we must defy it. At the end of our visit to Auschwitz-Birkenau, we were all feeling unexplainable emotions. What we felt is hard to describe, from pure sadness and sorrow to complete disdain and anger. It was more difficult for us than we thought it would be in terms of identifying our thoughts and feelings. Our tour, our, our tour guide was incredible. She helped us understand by trying to understand us. She said so many powerful things, but what stood out to me most, something I'll never forget, is in our moments of helplessness and unraveling emotion, she reminded us of something we all needed to hear. In a hushed and calm tone, she explained to us that by being there at the camp, remembering the innocent lives lost, we were paying tribute to those murdered. We were rehumanizing the individuals that the Nazis tried so hard and so systematically to dehumanize. Her words connected us to each other and the situation in a way that we hadn't felt before. We realized that we went on that trip for a reason, to pay tribute to the dead, because in the brilliant words of Eli Wiesel, to forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. No books or documentaries can amount to the feeling of stepping foot onto a concentration camp. The ugly truth is suddenly, unavoidably, right before your eyes. Genocide is all too often conceived to be a distant and intangible concept, however, the very same hate that we see in the prejudice and judgment overwhelmingly prevalent in our society is the hate that culminated into the mass killing of 11 million people in the Holocaust. But it must be known that the Holocaust is not simply an isolated historical event. Unfortunately, genocide occurred prior to the Holocaust and continues to occur around the world today. And in order to avoid genocide in the future, the dangerously powerful hate that plagues society must be diminished. This experience did not just elicit feelings of sorrow, but also unveiled the hard power of hate as the root of many evils. Evils that could be avo avoided if we, the human race, could stop hating. We must bring an end to prejudice and judgment and instead embrace diversity, appreciate our differences, and love what makes us human. Although much of our experience was based off events that have occurred in the past, we have all come home with a new idea of how we must act in the present. Many people did not speak out against the Nazis, and this caused the Holocaust to progress and kill off an entire generation. It was shocking how close the towns were to the camps that we visited. At Mauthausen, one local woman wrote the camps, complaining about the horrendous noises that were coming from the quarry. She asked the guards to please quiet down the prisoners or remove them. Rather than speaking out against the heinous crimes she knew were occurring, she chose to hide them. Many people feel that one person can't change the world, but we have come to the realization that we can. We have all learned that even the littlest comment could make someone re reconsider something mean or inconsiderate they may have said. It could even inspire them to be kind to others in the future. As we heard from Jonathan, the ripple effect can be used for good. We all must speak up for what we believe in. We have all learned to embrace our differences, we hope to teach and inspire others with the lessons we have learned from this trip.
N nice to have the power of you sitting down again. How nice. Um, I, I am so proud of every single one of you. This is very emotional because I actually had the great privilege of joining Edie Kane on her first trip. And the students that participated on that trip are now graduated from college or are on the cusp of graduating from college. And now I see another generation of our kids participating on this. And you got it. You got it. You know, this is, first of all, a tribute to Edie Kane because you have opened up a world to our children and exposed them to an experience that one really cannot fully appreciate and understand until they're there. And even then, it really, um, it, it, it really, it, it, it speaks a volume of words to be able to have this kind of hands-on experience and to be exposed to the many people that the children were able to meet um, and obviously to the, to the many countries and to the concentration camps. It, it, is, it is a very poignant, moving, um, and it's a distressing experience also because I just, it obviously, as everybody expressed, it, um, it, it taps into many, many, many different emotions. Um, I, I, I really can't even express the pride I have for every one of you. First of all, thank you for taking time from your schedules. I know you're busy. I know you have a lot of homework and many other things to do. And to come here and to share your experience and your story, it's really important that everybody hear that. Um, and what's even more important for you as as students who participated in this experience is that you're now stewards of, um, of humanity and you now have the partly responsibility and partly in terms of what your comfort zone is but you can teach others now you know you, you, you pass on this experience to others and you interface with them in the way that obviously you're comfortable interfacing, but you're getting, you're passing on a message that's very, very, very important for people to hear. Um, because this is clearly a time in history that no one should ever forget, and that clearly you won't forget. This has been a real adult life experience for all of you who've gone through this. And um, I want to thank you, and I want to thank your parents for supporting this. Um, and I look forward to you continuing to message this throughout the school year um, and continue to interface with your peers. And Edie, I, again, you know, it's, it's, it's people, there are a few life experiences that we have when we go through school. And, you know, this is something that no one ever forgets. And this is something that our kids will carry with them for the rest of their life. And I just want to really thank you for for being a part of that and, and, and to really doing all the heavy lift here and, and ensuring that, that they do have this type of experience. So thank you. You can go now. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I could not agree more uh, with Willa's words and sentiments, and I think our students are truly now ambassadors, not just of Eastchester, but, but of the world, and uh, we are just enormously proud, and uh, so I want to thank our students for being out tonight, and Edie and all the parents uh, who are part of this. What a, what a great experience. Before we get into the budget tonight, I just had one other piece of very good news I wanted to share with the community, and that is that um, State Education Commissioner John King had announced uh, just last week that New York State has nominated one school for the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School Program. Only one school in New York State that was nominated for that award 
And that school is our own Ann Hutchinson School. So we are so proud of Ann Hutch for their efforts. <laughs> it's a real testament to the entire school community, uh, the students, the staff, Mrs. Cherry, uh, their commitment to the environment uh, is just unbelievable. And we're so proud, and we hope that nomination moves forward. But we are enormously proud of them. So I wanna, I wanna make note of that tonight. That's a great, great piece of news for our district. So let's talk tonight about the preliminary budget for the 2014-15 school year. And if I hold it the right direction, it actually moves forward. That's <laughs> okay. So when we look at the school budget, there are many aspects and elements of the budget uh, that, that are part of that discussion. And so we look at it uh, from these different aspects. We look at the educational programs, curriculum and instruction, special ed, uh, extracurricular and athletics, that would fall under education. We look at staffing. We meet with building principals uh, in the fall and in, and, and in December. We talk about staffing. We look at our instructional staffing. We look at our classified staffing. Uh, elements of technology. So for instance, in this coming year's budget, uh, the IPA, the installment purchase agreement, will pay for things including uh, maintenance and replacement of, of smart board projectors, uh, wall mounting of our projectors, laptops and other portable electronic devices that students will use, uh, infrastructure that will accommodate upgrades to our emerging wireless network. So those are things that are part of our, our technology budget. With facilities, many of you know that our, our new middle school wing, uh, the addition will be coming on board very soon, and that's an exciting addition to our community, something to be very proud of. We also have our field and track project that will take place uh, this summer and fall, and the repointing project at the high school and middle school. So those are some of the facilities aspects of this budget that we'll be looking closely at and following. Transportation is a part of our budget as well. Um, obviously the bidding to ensure that we have the best provider uh, at the best price. We have a consortium uh, in East Chester that includes the Pelham, Bronxville, and Tuckahoe districts, and that consortium is part of uh, private parochial and special education school busing. Uh, we do that through Montauk Bus Company. So that's again part of our, our budget development, as is the debt service. And one of the things that we are really very grateful for in the district is we maintain a, a AA2 Moody's rating, and that helps us with interest rates when we borrow. That's a favorable rating, uh, and uh, that is a very big help when we go to, to borrow money for projects. And the state and federal mandates are part of budget development, and I'll speak a little bit about them uh, as this uh, presentation moves on. So, you know, we have the instructional program of our district, as was mentioned before. And we know that we have a robust program, very rigorous, and we know that our assessment scores and graduation rates and such, college acceptances, are really among the best in the county, the state, and in the country. Uh, we've talked in the past couple of budget discussions that we've had with the community um, about elements of, of that strong program. We've talked about how our grades three through eight state assessment scores in math, ELA, and science are among the top 3.1% in all of New York State. We talked about how 100% of our eighth grade students who take algebra and earth science regents exams reach proficiency on those exams. How the middle school was named a common sense signature school for the digital citizenry course and how the middle school is also now adopting new global technology programs in our, in our new labs. At the high school, over 90% of high school students who take algebra one, geometry, algebra two, trig, English, global history, U.S. history, biology, chemistry, and physics regions, over 90% of those students achieve proficiency levels, the highest percentage that we've seen since the 1990s. The passing rates in this past school year for high school students, percentage of those who passed their respective courses, was the highest rate since 1999. For the eighth consecutive year in our high school, over 90% of graduates pursued a college education. And of the 19 different advanced placement exams that we offer at the high school, our students outperform the national and state average scores on 14 of those 19 exams. This spring, we'll have 509 advanced placement exams taken by our students, 125 of whom are eligible to take courses for college credit, and 85 of whom are involved currently in a computer programming course. Now, 
as we move into this next budget year, as challenging as it is, and, and with, with those challenges that we will speak to tonight, you should know that there are some things that we're doing beyond the current program. For instance, we'll be adding an advanced placement course next year in computer science. That will be for these students who are following up on the course they're currently taking. We'll be revamping the middle school AIS program. That's the um, Academic Intervention Services program, a revamping of that in middle school. We'll be expanding the STAR diagnostic reading to grade seven next year, and that will encompass then grades two through seven. And we'll also be piloting uh, the Reading Wonders program next year in grades four and five. We just saw one example of an extracurricular activity our students were involved in uh, with, with a very exciting trip. But the district offers dozens of these uh, extracurricular and athletic activities and you know just the extracurricular activities alone clubs and such there are 32 at the high school and 14 at the middle school a very large number of our students are involved in these programs and this is an important piece of what we teach as we saw tonight and our sports programs as we know offer students of all interests and skill levels the opportunity all the way through intramurals to interscholastic sports among the extracurricular activities, we're proud of all of them, but we have things including Science Olympiad. Uh, we, have, we had 71 students last year who uh, were nominated um, into the National Junior Honor Society in eighth grade. We have a great performing arts program that includes Players Club and Jazz Co. Uh, we have clubs in art, Spanish, Italian, French, math, science, business, uh, and National Honor Societies. We participate in Model Congress, Academic Challenge, uh, and the National History Bowl. And of course, we're so proud of all of our athletic teams. Uh, just recently, our high school boys team participated in the Section 1 championship game at the county center. And all of our fall athletic teams and coaches volunteered this year in East Chester Youth Sports Day. Again, continuing a great tradition in our community and school for service, many, many of our students volunteer their time to support charities through student government. And even in our early to mid grades, <clears throat> we have character education programs, including Rachel's Challenge, Kindness Follows Caring at Ann Hutch, Greenvale Pride at our own Greenvale School. Again, integral in the education of all of our children. Some of the community service um, examples that we have in our high school include the community blood drives for the Red Cross. Uh, we have a full school implementation of the Dignity for All Students Act in our schools. We have charity fundraisers at all levels, K through 12. And many of our service organizations include things such as Habitat for Humanity, uh, the Human Rights Club, Operation Smile. And this month we have Dancing with Our Stars and that supports Gilda's Club of Westchester, which is a cancer support group. So again, many, many fine examples here of community service. And that's an important part of our program as well. So we take a look at all of the elements of our, of our program, both curricular and extracurricular. And each year as we evaluate uh, those programs and we look to move forward into the next school year, uh, we have to look carefully at them. And one of, one of the impacts certainly uh, is the tax levy uh, limit that we have to account for. And all of that goes into the program that we propose for the coming year. And that is why I think many of you are here tonight is to see how we are going uh, to meet that very difficult challenge. The challenges are ones we've spoken about in the past couple of meetings. The rising expenditures, for example, and these are approximate costs. We're looking at uh, New York State teacher retirement system costs this year, additional costs of about 400,000. We're looking at health insurance costs across the district, again, over 400,000. Social security, approximately 71,000. Workers comp, about 35,000. Those four examples alone account for $900,000 of expenditures beyond this school year. We look at federal and state mandates, and we often toss that word about and those terms about, the mandates, the mandates, and if you ever stop to look <coughs> at the list of what these mandates are, you'd find that there are pages and pages and pages, there are hundreds of them. But just to give you some example of the kinds of mandates that we're referring to, things that include comprehensive daily attendance and period attendance in our schools, the five-year facilities plan, a district-wide safety plan, academic intervention services, state testing and the reporting that goes with state testing, our APPR program and the professional development uh, that, that's accorded to that, Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA compliance, 
translation services that we have both for state testing and even uh, at CSE meetings. All of these are just examples of some of the unfunded state and federal mandates, and these are part of our budget. These are things that we're expected to do, we're required to do. The funding has to be picked up here at the school. We've talked about depleting revenue streams. Uh, we've talked about the allowable, the maximum allowable tax levy, which for us this year in East Chester is 3.21%. We've talked a great deal about state aid, which, which accounts for about 5.17% uh, of our district budget. And I want to thank so many of the people in our community who sent letters to Amy Paulin and to George Latimer, uh, asking them to please reconsider the gap elimination. That gap elimination adjustment in this year's budget will account for nearly $715,000, that's the projection, of aid that we will not receive. And over the past five years, that figure has amounted to $3.7 million of state aid that has not come to East Chester. That's a significant, significant amount of money, uh, and that's a huge part of our revenue. And also we've talked about how our um, our special uh, our tuition for special students will be down this year, and that's, that's really because many districts are now bringing students back to educate them in their communities, and so we're losing some revenue there. So that's the revenue picture. And of course, enrollment, East Chester continues to, to increase in its enrollment. Next year, the high school will see an increase of 23 students, the middle school 15, Greenvale 9, and Hutch will see a reduction of 44. And Waverly may, may turn out to be even, although it's trending a little bit low in kindergarten now. We have to monitor the kindergarten enrollment. So these are some of the challenges uh, that we face in looking at our budget. This is a powerful slide because it says that in the past two years, we've had the obligation of, of reducing spending a million dollars in 12-13 and $675,000 last year. And I want to just take a minute to talk about some of the things that have been part of these spending reductions over the past number of years, because uh, there's a cumulative effect here. We've lost teaching positions, uh, 10 teaching assistants, libraries, librarians and li library clerks, music teachers, middle school department chairs, custodial and clerical staff, technology support, administrative positions, guidance counselor, monitors, two after school buses, a middle school, high school youth counselor, a social worker, and transportation to our arts festival. These are, these are the changes that occurred prior to this year, steps that we've tried to take to reduce spending. Uh, that's the approximately 60 positions here that are listed. The important information moving forward into the 14, 15 years on this slide. We see at the top our current budget, 75,726, and we see the proposed budget of 76,919. 403. And as said before, the maximum allowable tax levy increase this year will be 3.21%. Now, at the back of the room, there are documents that explain how we arrive at the maximum allowable tax levy. It's a formula, and you should take a look at that form. It includes uh, the important figures in our budget, but it also accounts for some of the debt uh, that's incurred by, by virtue of the projects, the capital projects that we're involved in. So that number uh, for East Chester is 3 0.21% in this budget year. On this slide, you can see how that revenue is generated in terms of percent. And with, with little surprise to you, the three largest, well, well the three largest areas, taxes 89.2%, uh, again, impacted by the tax levy uh, cap. The state aid, 5.17, greatly impacted by the gap elimination. Uh, tuition, as we said before, will be down this year. So our three largest sources of revenue uh, are less than we would like them to be. And that, that's the breakdown of how uh, East Chester's revenue occurs in the district. We look at our expenditures, and here we see payroll and benefits at just slightly over 80%, facilities, transportation, support for instructional programs, for non-instructional, debt and transfer to capital. So that's the expenditure slide, and that's how we see how uh, our monies are, are spent in that regard. So. How do we get the $1.35 million that we were talking about over the last couple of meetings? How do we get there so that we can move forward in this year's budget? So the preliminary budget that I present tonight includes these reductions. You'll see the word FTE in many categories. It's a full-time equivalent. That's the, uh, the acronym for, for full-time equivalent. It means that sometimes it's a real one person 
and sometimes it's a piece of different people. So an FTE is a full-time equivalent of a teacher, a teaching assistant, or a support staff member. So we're looking at reductions of seven FTE teachers, three teaching assistants, 5.2 FTE support staff. We're proposing for this year moving forward that East Chester withdraw from the Collaborative High School Consortium, that we reduce our school building, central office, and athletic supply budgets beyond the reductions that were in place even earlier, and that we look for, for savings in reduced printing and mailing as we move forward, and we rely much more on electronic versions of this and try to save some money, because we're in a point now that uh, it's critical that we do that. I'd like to break down for just a moment the uh, reductions that you saw on the previous slide. The seven FTE teachers includes one from the Collaborative High School, it includes four at our elementary schools, and it includes 2.0 middle school slash high school. The three teaching assistants, one from the Collaborative High School, two from our elementary schools, and again, as we said before, 5.2 support staff. How that breaks out in terms of staffing uh, in our building, here you can see the cumulative total sections uh, in our buildings. Waverly will, will remain at 20 sections into next year. Ann Hutch will reduce from 19 to 17. One of those sections is by attrition and one is by larger class size. Greenvale will be maintained at 23 sections. So our total sections across the elementary schools will go from 62 this year to 60. And this is the class size projection based upon the reductions that were presented. So it's 23 at Waverly, kindergarten 22.9, grade one, Ann Hutchinson, grade two, 26.3, 22.8 for grade three, 25.5 in grade four, 25 in grade five in Greenvale, grade two, 25.3, grade three, 25.5, grade four, 23.6, and grade five, 25.8. The Waverly is an estimate, as we say, the kindergarten registration is ongoing, and so we're looking at projections based upon previous years. At the moment, it's trending a little bit lower. We'll know better at the end of this month how that, how that will factor in, but we're projecting 10 sections. So the question is, if this budget does not pass on May 20th, what would occur? Well, the district would have an opportunity to put forth another budget for voter consideration, a second budget. However, if the second budget also fails to pass, at that point, the tax levy drops to a zero. That would mean that the district would have to find $3.47 million in reductions, which is 2.13 beyond the reductions that we're incorporating into tonight's preliminary budget. And of course, at that time, uh, with, with cuts as draconian as that might be, we would be looking at the elimination of non-mandated programs, as you see there, including sports, extracurriculars, music, art, and guidance, and it would most likely result in, a, in approximately 30 positions that would have to be eliminated in order to reduce 3.47. Our budget vote and trustee election is May 20th from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Voting this year will be at the high school gym and also at Garth Road Community Center for those Garth Road residents. As we do the hard work that's ahead in looking at these reductions, and maintaining the best programs that we can. We do so with a sense of optimism, but we also do so with a sense of reality. And we know that this is quite a challenge. Remembering always what our mission is, remembering the students that we serve. I think it's fair to say tonight that this is a budget that reflects the urgency of a difficult time, where revenues are limited and declining, where expenditures are rising, and where continued deep cuts in staffing are required to balance these realities. It's a time when our enrollment is on the rise, when the challenges of implementing the Common Core State Standards and the accountability assessment models of New York State collide. It's a time when the rollout of these initiatives uh, is actually under very heated debate in Albany. The reductions in this budget are real, they are deep, and they are impactful. The necessity of reducing our current budget by $1.35 million to stay within the maximum allowable tax levy is a daunting challenge. So again, I repeat, this tonight is a budget that reflects the urgency of a difficult time. If 
if there are any questions from the board, uh, I'd be happy to answer them from here. <coughs> love to see um, not so much an analysis but actually the, the, the trend over the last five to ten years of the taxes uh, I mean state aid um, as a proportion of our revenues so you know I mean, Walter did you have it at, it was over 80 percent state aid five point no no, no 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 the percentage of our revenue that is I'm sorry that the taxable part of our revenue yes yeah. Eighty. It's up to eighty-seven percent. No. Eighty-nine. Eighty-nine percent. I'd be curious to see what's hap how that's tracked up in the last ten years. And if it's either a shorter period of time, I'm sure it's just going to be dramatic. Thank you. I wish I could say thank you, but I know they were thoughtful proposals. Uh, unfortunately, it's a Herculean task, as you indicated, with. Uh, Considering it's it being building on what's previously been done, and none of these are easy, obviously. Uh, but you know, I know they're thoughtful proposals that from, from you and your staff. So, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moran makes his way over. Do we have any board committee reports? I don't think any of them were meeting. So in that case, oh, oh, you do. Yes, I'm sorry. Education, right? OK. Mary, should we talk about our advocacy over the uh, communications sure. committee? Um, do, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> okay. um, Mary and I co-chair the community relations committee and um, <clears throat> apropos to what has just been presented by Dr. Moran, um, one of the areas that we are um, forever hopeful that, uh, <clears throat> that could potentially be impacted is the um, <clears throat> GEA, um, the gap. And those are monies that um, the, that adjustment that was made um, through the state for monies that were ostensibly were taken from our budget over the years. And um, <clears throat> were they to be replenished, can you hear? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Were they, that's right, okay, forgive me. Okay, um, were they to be replenished, um, we're looking at over $700,000, which can certainly make a dramatic impact on the current budget deficit that we have of 1.34. So as a result of that, with um, a great lift um, from Mary Ellen Byrne um, and from the Community Relations Committee, and most, um, most um, emphatically, I will uh, commend and thank the PTA leaders and the PTA, all of the members of the PTAs. We have um, taken on another letter writing campaign <clears throat> this year um, and over 700, to date, over 700 letters have gone out individually to Amy Paulin and George Latimer. Amy is our assembly woman, George is our state senator, and to the governor. So we've. Yeah, 700 times. Correct. So we have ostensibly delivered over 2,100 letters from the parents in our community. We are also joined by many of our neighboring districts who actually have um, borrowed our protocol in our letters um, because they're, 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 they've been so impressed um, <clears throat> with not only the messaging, but the way we've been able to really in a very, very simple way effectively reach out to our legislators. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that this has become a regional um, <clears throat> uh, initiative and um, we just have to keep we have to just keep at it. And I ask that any parent who's listening now who has not sent out a letter to please go on our website. You, it literally takes you, it takes you less than a minute to do. Um, but you're making a statement. And I think that volumes hopefully will, will speak words in terms of um, us as constituents who are 
enormously disappointed with what's going on with the state and the budgets and, and the lack of resources that have been provided to our schools. So we're going to continue that effort. Um, Mary, did you want to add anything? No, I would just say, as, as you said, um, if you haven't done it, do it. Please. If you know people who haven't done it, get them to do it. <clears throat> Ask people if they've done it, remind them. Um, we really need the emails to continue to come in. Right, right. And I did happen to see George Latimer just recently in the past week in Albany. Um, and they're paying, they pay attention. You, you, can't pay, you can't not pay attention to letters, the volume of letters that have been received. Um, <clears throat> also remember everyone that this is an election year. So it has that much more of an impact to our legislative leaders. Um, and certainly, um, you know, I think that in terms of those who are advocating for us, I think that Amy Pollan and George Latimer really happen to be one of the more savvy legislators. Thank God they're representing us. So I think that you know it's, it, it's not difficult for them to understand the impact nor help pass on the message for us to their own, to their own colleagues. <clears throat> the only thing I would add to that is, is uh, I think you, got, you, you deserve kudos as well as Mary Ellen Byrne for once again, East Chester has been at the forefront of mm -hmm. leading this charge uh, because we're not alone in facing it. We may be uh, one of the few growing districts which makes the impact of all of these programs or policies uh, more detrimental to East Chester, but East Chester has been in the forefront of this as we were in trying uh, to fight the imposition of the tax cap, which is also part of why we're having this uh, or considering these drastic cuts. Uh, and, and we were in the forefront of the trying to charge against that. We were early in recognizing what the potential impact of that would be. Uh, and that, along with the gap elimination aid, which if there's no deficit anymore for the state, there's no reason for the gap elimination. So it would be nice if they would recognize that, and hopefully they will. Uh, but we've been in the char leading the charge in trying to get these things done. And, and that's kudos to uh, the legislative advocacy that we really have in this district that we've built up over the last few years. So, good job. You know, I just want to say another talking point. There's been so much press about pre-K, and there was a very interesting article on the front page of the New York Times a few days ago <laughs> about um, a mother in particular focused on in a school district, and it's an affluent school district, where because of the tax cap, be because of these um, issues with budgets, they have cut back to half-day kindergarten. And this woman said, I don't understand why there is all this discussion about pre-K when it's been proven by many studies the importance of full-day kindergarten. And here my child in a well-off school district where I am paying pretty substantial property taxes my child only has half-day kindergarten. Try restoring full-day kindergarten before you go this other step. What about the children who are already in the schools and how they're being impacted by what is going on right now? And I, I just wish, and there was in the journal news, there was a letter to the editor which also went into that, in, that exact same issue. Um, so, you know, if anyone wants to pick up a pen, um, and write a letter to the newspapers, any of the local newspapers, or to the Times, you know, please go ahead. Take the kind of language that we have in our emails and go with it. This is important. We need to get it out there. You know, and I just wanted to, I, I guess you have us all on the bandwagon here, but um, the, the inference by the governor is that there's a surplus in the budget, and that surplus has come as is a result of all the cuts that we as districts have sustained over the years. So this latest gap elimination adjustment, um, which is one, one of our major, major cuts, what, what's ended up happening here, as you can see from the presentation that Dr. Moran just gave us on our budget, um, we are literally you know, off of the backs of the children here in our school system now we are now cutting into the core of our curriculum and into the core of our district all to service this surplus that the governor is really presenting as a misnomer um, because in fact these are monies that were due to the school district 
and have subsequently not been reinstated. So, and if we think this is hurting this year, and now we're in the third year of our tax cap, we have two more years in front of us. And some of the other school districts who might have had some re fund reserves or whatnot and some monies that could buffer this, everyone now, everyone across the region is beginning to feel these significant cuts because at this juncture, there's very little buffer, certainly no buffer here in this district. So it's going to be interesting to see the way this evolves over this year and certainly going into next year when we'll continue to really you know, erode the core of our school system. So very, very, you know, very disconcerting, really, really serious stuff. It's, it's impacting all of us, all of us who have children in the district. And you can see with our classrooms, our sizes, unfortunately they're expanding and we're losing some of our, you know, just wonderful faculty and other services. And it's, 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 it's a somber time and, and everybody really has to step up here. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Uh, education committee? The, uh, the education committee uh, discussion this evening is the evolution of electives and extracurricular offerings. As published previously, it was uh, what do we want from electives and separately extracurricular activities, offerings to, our, uh, to provide our students? Uh, what are our expectations? How do we evaluate the effectiveness of our choices of elective offerings? And how can we ensure that extracurricular offerings evolve at the same pace and with the same urgency that our intracurricular offerings do? Given the juxtaposition of this discussion and Walt, uh, Dr. Moran's r report, I, I, we can certainly get to that, but I'd sort of like to lead off the conversation and, and ask Dr. Moran and, and, and Dr. Hatter, when we look at this budget, there, the, the cuts, there are no cuts in extracurriculars. Can you talk a little bit about what, dis what decision or what thought process went into that, deci that decision? I'll start, and then certainly Dr. Hatter can um, supplement what I've said. I think going back to several meetings, we talked about the importance. We talked about the importance of maintaining the integrity of programs and uh, the opportunities for students to excel and to find enrichment in our program. And I think that we saw that tonight in the students who were here. We saw that with the power uh, of these of these extra activities, and uh, it's an enhancement and enrichment of the education. It's a manifestation of what we learn uh, in the classroom. And when we look at the, uh, at the 32 clubs and activities in our high school, you know, we see things, we mentioned some tonight, but there are things like the chemistry club, uh, the debate club, EGO, uh, Going Green, Habitat for Humanity, Human Rights Club, uh, there's a pep band, a video club. Th these are opportunities for which our students uh, are, are heavily engaged after school and on weekends, and it's an important extension of their learning. Uh, in the middle school, we have clubs that include art. Uh, we have a Boston club, a chess club, debate, history, an international club, jazz band, um, student council, student leadership, Washington, yearbook. These are opportunities for students um, to develop skills of leadership, to develop an affinity to the community, to the schools, to have a chance to really excel and to explore. Uh, these are not the places that we want to begin uh, in terms of removing. You can remove, an, once you remove an activity or a club, it's gone. It's gone. You can't offer part of it. And if you remember back a few years ago, we cut back on some of the length of these clubs and activities. So whereas the debate or history club in the middle school might have been full year a couple of years ago, now these are semester. Uh, in some cases, these are semester clubs and activities. So we have made some reductions over the years, but I think this is a place where we want to provide the opportunity for students to excel. Again, as you look at the high school level uh, toward moving into college, and you look at filling out your applications, these are the kinds of activities and involvement and leadership that's going to make a student's transcript really stand out. So I think it's critical that we maintain that to the extent that we can, that we don't start there, that we don't begin there. Ronnie. I think you captured our position very well, Dr. Moran, but essentially what I just would like to add to the discussion is that when we sat down as a team to look at the reductions that Dr. Moran and, and the group would propose to our Board of Education, we 
I hope it reflects a, a, a process that, that was thoughtful, that was considerate of the whole student and not just looking at the academic uh, component of the education experience. So what I do want to share with you is with regard to class size, it's higher than optimal for me anyway in terms of what we're proposing. However, when we weigh that against the other reductions that we had to make, do we not offer all of these other opportunities? As Dr. Moran said, when they're gone, they're gone. Or do we increase a class size by one or two students? And what the research has pointed to, Michael Schmoker's work has pointed to, is that the single most important factor of a child's academic success in school is the effectiveness of the teacher in front of them. And I like to think that East Chester has the most effective teachers in not only the county, but in the state and in the world. Our teachers are wonderful. So we felt that we could preserve our extracurricular program and make the reduction in other areas. Anybody else? Question? OK. Thank you. Thanks. All right, in that case, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, John, you want to do personnel and uh, committee on special ed? I'd like to move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools. Please see attached personnel recommendations for our personnel agenda. Also, I move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent to approve special education student placements as recommended by our committee on special education. Michelle, can I get a second? I second. Okay. Any discussion, comments, questions? Okay, all in favor? Wait tonight, right? Okay, uh, Mary, you want to do business office? Yeah. Um, and I guess other business, if you don't mind? Move uh, as a recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the following warrants. Number eight, cafeteria fund D, 225.14. Number nine, trust and agency fund, 225.14. And number eight, general special aid and capital fund, 225.14. Move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools to approve the minutes from the February 11th, 2014 work session meeting and the February 25th, 2014 board of education meeting. Move resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools to approve the authorization of budget transfers of $10,000 or over within various codes, all general fund for the months of December 2013 and January 2014. Should I keep going? Yeah, if you don't mind. Move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools to approve the school calendar for 2014-2015. Move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools to approve the following tax certiorari, Three Olive Restaurant Group LLC, 219 Main Street Settlement for the amount of $57,307.79. Move the resolution as recommended by the superintendent of schools to approve the following grants. 10-18-2013, um, donor state Steve Niss recipient HS High School Auditorium Project in the amount of $3,100. Um, Bank of America grant donation for athletic CPR, $5,000. Lucia Torres, a donation for middle school athletics in the amount of $300. East Chester Service Station, Inc., an Exxon Mobil grant for Greenvale School in the amount of $500. SEPTA, special education grant for iPads, et cetera, in the amount of $4,526.96, and Greenvale PTA, a grant for replacement easel, the amount $103.99. Thank you. Uh, Paul, can I get a second? Second. Any discussion, comments, questions? I would just say thank you very much to every one of those donors. Very much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. I second that. Very generous. Okay. Uh, Paul. Me. Uh, all in favor? Okay. And that brings us to comments from the public. Anybody want to come up and speak? Um, I get to the 11 to the lane. The, uh, 
Withdrawal from the high school, the Collaborative High School Consortium. I'm not even familiar with what that is. Can you just explain what that is? And how much is that as a line item? Yes, I will, um, I'll be happy to answer that for you. Let me just pull out my information here. The Collaborative um, High School, Mr. Levin, is a, is a partnership that East Chester in, entered into no, a number of years ago along with the Port Chester and White Plains schools. Um, subsequently, White Plains has pulled out. That was three years ago. Port Chester pulled out of the consortium or the partnership last year. And BOCES uh, sends about 24 students. So at the, at the time, at its maximum use, there were approximately between 35 and 48 students at the Collaborative School. Uh, currently, the Collaborative High School is located on the, on the Rye Lake campus. Um, and East Chester has provided for that program uh, a, a teacher and a teaching assistant, um, as well as we pay a $50,000 fee to, to be part of that uh, partnership. Uh, the program has been very good at helping uh, students uh, make up credits, providing a small class size uh, for students, um, differentiating curriculum in a Regents Track program, uh, crisis intervention teams for students when that was a need, social workers um, and psychiatric uh, support was part of that, and outreach to families. This is a program currently that East Chester uh, at year's end has three students in, uh, two of whom will be graduating in a year. Um, and so we've reached a point in that program we, where we think the cost savings for the district uh, are certainly worth putting toward the, the difficult challenge that we have. So that's the Collaborative High School program. Um, and what we're recommending is that we withdraw from that. And we will maintain a couple of seats in that program as needed. And then we would pay to send students to that program if that were, if that were required. But that would still be a great cost savings for us from, from what we currently are doing. Do you have an approximation what the cost savings is? Well, it's the cost of a, of a teacher and a teaching assistant and $50,000. So, Marilyn, you can help me with that. It's I'm sorry, it's over 200000 okay. We used okay. to have uh, eight students, generally eight students. And what's happened over time is you know, they have uh, it's come down. OK. You mentioned there were four elementary full-time, I guess, teachers being reduced. Yes. Some of my notes when the screens were going quickly, I, I must have missed something. There were two from Ann Hutch. Yes. And where are the other two? Well, the other two are, again, remember the sections that we showed on the slide indicate classroom teachers. Some of these cuts are not directly classroom teachers that would be teaching a section. So they okay. might be other, other, so that's why you don't see that directly there. The actual sections moving forward are what you saw on the screen. So there are two additional positions. All right, great, thank you. Uh, an easier question, How, how's the construction going? The construction is going very well. In fact, Mr. Doyle, why don't you speak? You're, <laughs> no, right. You're very happy, so it must be a good thing. Yeah. On Friday, I had the pleasure of uh, reading at Ann Hutch, and I had some time to kill, so I dragged John Condon and Dr. Moran and Carmine and got a personal tour, yeah. and uh, it, looks, it, it, it looks great. It's phenomenal. Um, I have given my condolences to Jeff Capuano because when the middle school kids walk in there, the high school kids are going to go, why them? <laughs> um, it's beautiful. It, yeah. It's really great. The science rooms are tremendous. Um, and I think that if the population grows any longer, we could store them in the cabinets in the I science so. rooms because there's a lot. Um, it's great. It just looks great. It's a construction site still. Right. The floors are going down. The, the, the lighting is there. Um, the natural light that comes from, if you recall the design, it's a cantilevered roof on the top floor that has uh, translucent or windows at the at, at top with you know 15 foot ceiling. It's just spectacular. It's great. Good. And the uh, track, the redoing the track, is that any update on that or that's, that's still that's a that's a summer project, and we, what we're waiting for at this time is approval from state ed. Once right. we get approval from state ed on on the project, then it will go out to bid. And it's our hope that that work occurs this summer um, so that we'll be ready in the fall, maybe not September, but in the fall. That was our plan to have the field and track ready. So that's, we're just awaiting state, um, state ed approval right. on, the, on the plan that was submitted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Diane Filiberti, uh, Park Drive. First, I want to thank you all for, I know that this has been a very difficult task 
and for trying to keep the integrity in these horrible times um, of our school district. So I want to say thank you. Um, my question is, at what point in time, I know this is preliminary, um, at what point in time will we know, I know that we in, at PTA Council have, to, has discu have discussed um, really approaching this as a district, not individual schools. At what point in time will we have a better understanding of how this is really affecting each school, like where these numbers are coming from? Does that make sense? It's very complicated because, a, because when a cut is made of a position, the individual who's impacted by the cut is not always the person who is in that position. You know how this works. It, it's by seniority. So uh, we will we'll put more meat on this, but I, I think that what you saw in the diagram should give you an approximation of where those are. Two of the, two of the reductions uh, in the elementary are at Ann Hutch. Um, I think I can say tonight, one is in Waverly, although it's not seen in the classroom um, a reduction that you saw there. And um, the fourth one, help me run, I'm struggling for, it's support, it's a support class, uh, not a regular classroom teacher. So um, that's, that's essentially where it is. In the middle school, high school, those cuts are really sort of little pieces of things. That's why we use the term FTE. It's not always one person, but it might be a point two of English and math and science and art and different things that, that total an amount that, that gets us toward, um, you know, toward that. So, okay. um, I th hopefully that helps, but I think some of it you saw tonight, some of it you won't see so directly on these slides because they're not impacted with classroom teachers through, through direct classroom instruction. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, can I get a motion to recess into executive no. session? No, no, no I'm sorry, comments, comments from the board. board. I'm sorry, you're right, comments from the board. Thanks. Sorry, I'm chomping That's a okay, bit. go ahead. Vito's not here, so I'm going to yeah, channel. There you go. Um, you know, I was struck tonight, a little bit uh, semantics. Um, you used the term tax cap. You brought up the gap elimination adjustment. First on tax cap, it's sold, or the, the common term is tax cap, but it's not a tax cap because my taxes went up. And I'm sure all your tax, taxes went up. If you're specific, it's a tax levy cap. What it really is, is a budget cap. The governor takes credit for and does nothing at the state level but dump it down to the school boards. And for three years, we've been doing that, and he's been getting credit, and we've been drawing back on our schools. That bothers me. It also bothers me the semantic and the ruse that the terminology is. If we're going to be honest about things, these are tough times. Let's at least have the respect for each other to use the right terminology for what it is. He's enforced a budget cap on the localities because he has not the power, the wherewithal to get it done at the state level. On the gap elimination adjustment, the, that's law, okay? So if, as Will as Willa mentioned, we're now in surplus, there's no gap to eliminate. So the law says that we're supposed to get, as a school district, this money. Now the other thing on this point that Mary raised, that 700 residents of this community sent, took the time to send letters to their representatives saying that they'd like recourse taken on this. What you don't know is that we got three letters or emails sent to the board taking issue with that. I would just like to explain a little bit to, to those without getting into the particulars to diffuse what the opposition is. And the opposition, the gap elimination aid has nothing to do with your property taxes. The, edu the state education department takes money out of your state income tax and that's what funds it and they have it. There's a law that says we run the state ed a certain way and we are going to fund the schools at this level and we're taking that back. Now six years ago for every dollar of an Eastchester residence tax that went up to Albany 13 cents came back to Eastchester 
because, because we're a global community or a statewide community, we send money across the state. We help the city schools, we help the farm communities upstate. That's good and right, but let's at least have the facts right on this. So that arguing about the gap elimination and saying, why should I fight for my taxes to go up is a misunderstanding of how it works. Your money is already gone. It's gone up to Albany and Albany saying you can't have it back even though the law says you're supposed to. So I implore the governor and our representatives and for all my fellow community members to understand that if you're going to eliminate it, then repeal the legislation and have the guts, the political courage and the honesty to say you don't need this money anymore. If the law is there, follow the law. Thank you. Well done. Well said. That was well said. Thanks, Your Honor. <laughs> it is. Actually, it's live, but it will be taped. I can't wait for this to keep rerunning. All right. Well, I, have to, I, I do want to follow up on that. Is that last, last time when I got back, Willie, my seventh grader, had been watching. I do not know why seventh grader is watching a Board of Ed meeting. I have to talk to Susan about that. We're going to have to track that on this, on this kid. But we introduced Willie to a new word. He's, he's, he commented on something I said, and I said, Willie, go get the dictionary and look up this word because this is what your old man is. And that word is a curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Well, I'm gonna Go do ahead. something entirely different, which Go Paul did reference, which was Ann Hutch had the read aloud um, program and it was just great. Yeah. And we have few chances to actually get into the classroom and see the children, or at least I have few chances to do that. <coughs> My kids are now in middle school and high school and you never get to come and really see them in the classroom. So it was great. I went to the third grade and I had a wonderful time. So I thank Ann Hutch for that and I'm happy to do it again next year. Yeah, it's a great time. All right. Thank you very much. Now can I get a motion to recess into executive session? Paul and Will is a second. All in favor? Thank you all for coming out.